This lecture outlines the usage of blood products in an acute hemorrhagic scenario. This is an outline of this lecture. These are some abbreviations that I will use throughout the lecture. Please refer back to the slide as needed. There are certainly no shortage of blood transfusion guidelines. The information in this presentation is in alignment with many of these guidelines. These guidelines come from the United States, the UK, Australia, the United States, the European Union, the United States, the United States, the United States, you get the picture. The first product we will cover are packed red blood cells, or PRBCs. They have several indications, but essentially you use them when the patient's hemoglobin is low or will soon become low due to an active hemorrhage. Red blood cell transfusions were previously given routinely whenever the hemoglobin level was less than 10 grams per deciliter. This practice was based on, upon unproven physiological and clinical assumptions. However, a hemoglobin concentration of less than 7 grams per deciliter became the accepted threshold after the multicenter transfusion requirements in critical care trial, or the TRIC trial. This trial randomly assigned 838 critically ill patients to either a transfusion threshold of less than 7 or a threshold of less than 10. This trial found out that a hemoglobin of less than 7 strategy was surprisingly better at decreasing hospital mortality. 30-day mortality was less in those under 55 years old and in the less acutely ill. These results have been replicated in several randomized controlled trials. Packed red blood cells do come with adverse effects. Common concerns are infection, allergic reaction, although rare, and volume, potassium, and iron overload. These overloads are particularly common in small patients or patients receiving many, many units of packed red blood cells. The risk of allergic reactions to the blood products can be minimized by cross-matching the blood products to determine what blood type the donor is, A, B, A, B, O, and supplying them with the correct blood type. If the patient is unconscious or unable to tell you their blood type and you don't have the time to test them to see what blood type they are, then type O should be given as all blood types can tolerate type O blood. Also, the level of hemoglobin increase is predictable in patients who are not actively bleeding. For every one unit of packed red blood cells given, the hemoglobin will usually increase by one gram per deciliter. The threshold of a hemoglobin level of less than seven isn't for all patients. Some patients were excluded from the previous studies and require packed red blood cells when their hemoglobin levels fall below eight to 10 based on the condition of the patient. Red blood cells can be provided in a few different forms. Packed red blood cells are generally 300 milliliters with 200 milliliters of that being red blood cells. These packed red blood cells can come as leukoreduced or not leukoreduced. Packed red blood cells that are not leukoreduced are cheaper but contain white blood cells which themselves carry bacteria within them putting the patient at a potential increased risk of post-infusion infection. Leukoreduced packed red blood cells are preferred for chronically transfused patients, potential transplant patients, patients with previous transfusion reactions, patients undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass, and some patients who are CMV seronegative and at risk for a CMV infection. Autotransfusion can also be helpful in some surgeries and scenarios if readily available. It collects the patient's own blood and recycles it back into the body. Also, warming the fluids first can help prevent hypothermia. This slide is just a reminder to show you that plasma accounts for 55% of blood content and red blood cells account for 44% of blood content. While white blood cells and platelets make up the remaining 1%. There are also a few different types of plasma products. 
the most commonly used being fresh frozen plasma. As the name indicates, it is what remains after platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells are removed. It is frozen and must be thawed prior to administration. After thawing, it must be used within 24 hours or clotting factors 5 and 8 will start to decrease. Cryoprecipitate is another important plasma product worth mentioning. Its benefit is that it can provide a high concentration of various clotting factors without the large volume associated with a product like fresh frozen plasma. The volume of one unit of fresh frozen plasma varies, but it is on average 250 to 350 milliliters. Cryoprecipitate cannot be used to reverse anticoagulation with a vitamin K antagonist because it does not contain all of the vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. Desmopressin is not a plasma product, but it does have several similar uses as it induces the release of multimers of factor VIII and von Willenbrand factor from endothelial cells. We will discuss desmopressin more later in the lecture. Plasma products have similar indications as packed red blood cells. However, their usage is based on platelet count instead of hemoglobin or hematocrit. Also, they should not be used to reverse warfarin unless there is an active bleed. Plasma products generally have an INR of greater than 1.3, so don't expect these products to lower the INR to anything less than 1.3. Plasma products can be used alongside PRBCs during a massive transfusion for a patient with a life-threatening bleed. The threshold for when to use platelets takes into account the patient's current situation. A platelet count less than 10 should always be transfused to prevent spontaneous hemorrhage. The threshold of less than 50 is used in patients who are actively bleeding have intrinsic platelet disorder, or are planning to undergo an invasive procedure or surgery. A threshold of less than 100 is used for patients with a CNS injury or undergoing a CNS surgery, multi-system trauma, or those who require an intrathecal catheter for anesthesia. Lastly, patients with a normal platelet count who have an ongoing active bleed and a reason for platelet dysfunction such as congenital platelet disorder, chronic antiplatelet therapy, or uremia. Special consideration should be considered for patients with life-threatening bleeding and some less common disease states, such as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, hemolytic uremic syndromes, as well as a few others. Platelets are often less effective or possibly detrimental in some cases, such as with TTP causing an increased risk of thrombosis when platelets are administered. Platelets, similar to PRBCs, have a predictable increase in lab level after administration. One potential problem with the infusion of blood products is that of citrate toxicity when massive amounts are given. Sodium citrate and citric acid are used as anticoagulants in blood products. Citric acid is not metabolized quickly when large amounts are given. This may cause two possible complications, metabolic alkalosis and also a reduction in ionized calcium as calcium binds with the citrate. This hypocalcemia may lead to hypotension, myocardial dysfunction or tetany and can be resolved by giving intravenous calcium into a different IV line. The calcium must be administered separately from the blood products. The dosing of calcium is based on how much blood product is given. Another possible complication not related to citrate but something that may occur during a massive transfusion is hyperkalemia due to leakage of potassium 
from the red blood cells that have been stored for a longer period of time. Next, we will talk about prothrombin complex concentrates, or PCC products. This is a graphic of the clotting cascade, just as a reminder of where each oral anticoagulant acts along the clotting cascade and which factors are involved. I also want to point out that when I'm referring to four-factor PCC, it is the four factors that warfarin acts on. There are three main types of PCC, activated PCC, four-factor PCC, and three-factor PCC. PCCs were originally developed for hemophilia, but now are mainly used for emergency vitamin K antagonist therapy reversal. Hemophilia B is only deficient in factor 9, whereas these products supply other factors as well. PCC has several benefits over FFP, including less volume, storage at room temperature, no blood type matching is required, less infections and allergic reactions, faster infusion time, and preparation time. However, the one concern is a slight increased risk of thrombosis. Thrombosis is dose-related, and factor 2 with a half-life of 60 hours is the main cause. It is important to recognize that warfarin reduces the level of vitamin K-dependent coagulation factors to varying degrees, with factor 9 remaining at 40-50% to 50 of normal levels and factor 10 at 10% of normal levels. For PCCs, there are contraindications, but they are relative to the situation. If someone's life is on the line, you sometimes may violate contraindications when there is no other alternative. Bariplex is the four-factor PCC available in Hong Kong. Dosing of the drug is complex. It is useful to have a pharmacist calculate the dose based on the INR of the patient and the weight-based infusion rate in addition to preparing the drug for infusion. The effect of INR lowering can be seen in 10 minutes. The INR level should be drawn 30 minutes after the infusion completes. There are several risk factors that have been identified that put patients who are taking warfarin at increased risk for developing a bleed associated with a supratherapeutic INR. This graph shows why INR ranges of 2 to 3.5 were selected. The red line is thromboembolism, which would be too little effect from warfarin, and the blue line is the intracranial hemorrhage, which would be too much effect from warfarin. We want both the thromboembolism line and the intracranial hemorrhage line to be as low as possible, which happens to be from roughly 2 to 3.5. Outside of this range, one or the other line starts to rise rapidly. Where is the most common site for a bleed in a patient on warfarin requiring a visit to the hospital? The most common is the GI tract, followed by the urine, intracranially, and then the skin. Now to discuss the treatment of warfarin-associated bleed with supratherapeutic INR and the use of blood products. The first thing, obviously, is to discontinue warfarin. Then, vitamin K should be administered as 5 to 10 milligrams IV over 20 to 60 minutes. IV is preferred over PO in urgent situations as it has a faster onset of action. Effects do, however, take a few hours to be seen as new clotting factors have to be made by the body when vitamin K is given. In patients with an INR of 6 to 10, IV vitamin K 0.5 milligrams brought INR to therapeutic range at 6 hours more than 2.5 milligrams PO. At 24 hours, there was no difference between the routes. Subcutaneous is not preferred as it has variable absorption which leads to variable efficacy.
The CHEST guidelines provide clear guidance of when to use vitamin K or 4-factor PCC with vitamin K. No treatment is needed for an INR of 4.5 to 10 without any evidence of bleed. This is based on four randomized controlled trials showing no additional benefit from vitamin K therapy in these patients. For patients without evidence of bleeding with an INR of greater than 10, oral vitamin K can be used. There are no randomized controlled trials supporting this recommendation. It is based on a few prospective studies only. If there is evidence of a major bleed, then both vitamin K and 4-factor PCC should be used. Now that we have identified that 4-factor PCC is only used during major bleeds, some other important things to note about 4-factor PCC is that the dosing regimens are complicated and that it has similar efficacy to FFP but with less adverse effects. A common question that is asked is when to resume warfarin therapy after a bleed, commonly 30 days for an intracranial hemorrhage and 4 to 7 days for a GI bleed. Other therapies that could be used under certain situations with a warfarin associated bleed and a supra therapeutic INR are antifibrinolytics like tranexamic acid, desmopressin, and blood product transfusions previously mentioned in this lecture. Let's switch gears and talk about a bleed associated with the new direct oral anticoagulants. We have one oral direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, or brand name Pradoxa, and a few parenteral direct thrombin inhibitors, with the one most commonly used in Hong Kong being bivalirudin. And we also have a few factor 10 inhibitors, rivaroxaban, or brand name Xarelto, Apixaban, or brand name Eliquis, are the ones currently available in Hong Kong. Edoxaban is not yet available here, and also Fondaparinex, or brand name Arixtra, is a factor 10 inhibitor, but it only comes in parenteral formulations. For this lecture, we will only discuss the oral anticoagulant agents. Lab testing is not routinely performed, nor is it reliably accurate test to determine the degree of anticoagulation. Other labs that may be drawn during a bleed in a patient on a new direct oral anticoagulant include hemoglobin level to determine severity, platelet count to determine if thrombocytopenia is contributing to the bleeding, renal function test as many of the new direct oral anticoagulants are renally eliminated, liver function tests to determine if liver disease is contributing to the bleed, as well as some other less common tests. For patients with a major bleed on one of these medications, prothrombin complex concentrates have been shown to normalize INR faster than FFP or vitamin K alone. The thrombosis risk in these patients after being given PCC is about 1.5 to 10% so they should only be used if it is a major bleed. Let's look at dabigatran reversal first. As with all of these oral agents, activated charcoal can be given if the last dose was taken less than two hours ago. Dabigatran is the only one of these agents where hemodialysis is useful as well. It has been shown that with 4 hours of hemodialysis, 57% of the dose can be removed. Hemodialysis is effective for dabigatran and not rivaroxaban nor apixaban because it has much lower protein binding. FIBA is the preferred PCC, otherwise use a 4-factor PCC like Bariplex. Although not yet available in Hong Kong, but worth mentioning, is the antidote for dabigatran, idarisizumab, or Praxbind. Praxbind is a humanized monoclonal antibody that is specific for dabigatran and completely reverses the effect of dabigatran within 10 to 30 minutes in 90% of patients.
it is very effective. It should not be given with a PCC as that is not how it was studied, plus it is effective enough without the PCCs. For rivaroxaban and apixaban, there is no antidote. In the situation of a major bleed, antifibrinolytics may be used and if there is imminent risk of death, 4-factor PCC at 50 units per kilogram may be used. If Bariplex is unavailable, 3-factor PCC along with FFP or recombinant factor 7 activated may be used. FFP is added to 3-factor PCC to provide the patient with some factor 7. INR and PT tests are more sensitive to factor 7 than the other vitamin K dependent factors. Next, I would like to provide some information about the other agents mentioned that can be used to treat a patient with an ongoing hemorrhage. The first class is the antifibrinolytics. Tranexamic acid is the one that is available in Hong Kong. These drugs work by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down clots. They help your body maintain the clots that have already been made. There are various dosing regimens that can be used for tranexamic acid. However, it is 95% excreted in the urine, so you should consider a dose adjustment in patients with renal dysfunction. There isn't much data supporting its usage. However, based on its mechanism of action and that there is a low risk for thrombosis, in addition to it being readily available and generally not too expensive, at least when compared to PCCs, it is commonly used. It does come with side effects, however, including headache, abdominal, back, and muscle pain. Desmopressin is only useful if the patient has platelet dysfunction, like if the patient is on antiplatelet agents, most commonly aspirin. Dosing and some pharmacokinetic properties are listed on the slide. The drug does come in oral and intravenous formulations. However, in the scenario of a major bleed, intravenous route is usually given. Something to note about desmopressin is that it works quite quickly has a low risk for thrombosis, and is cheap. Lastly, it is important to look ahead to see what the future holds for the reversal of oral anticoagulation. There are a couple of agents that have made it to the final phase 3 study stage of the FDA approval process. Siraparantag is unique in that it is an antidote for all the direct oral anticoagulants. It has been shown in phase 2 trials to normalize clotting time within 10 minutes. And Dexinet has just finished phase 2 trials and it will be the antidote for the factor 10 inhibitors rivaroxaban and apixaban. Some key points to take away from this lecture is that there will be upcoming changes to how we reverse anticoagulants in patients with a major bleed in the near future. It is important to know which reversal treatment is used for which anticoagulant and that desmopressin is for antiplatelet medications. You should understand the differences between the PCCs and their roles in therapy. And you should be able to list five disadvantages of FFP compared to PCC. These are some additional references, and that concludes this part of the emergency medicine module.